You ever have one of those Holy Spirit moments in your life where you know God is doing something supernatural right then in that moment? You ever, you ever experience that when he's uh, working in you or maybe in your circumstances or even in someone else's heart who you've been praying for and you know that it is the Spirit of God at work? No question, because whatever it is that's happening could not be achieved uh, by human effort alone, you know, where, where there's undeniable evidence of the Spirit of God moving on your behalf, or maybe even through you on someone else's behalf. Many years ago, I was working at a church uh, on staff, and uh, I was setting up for the service, for the evening service, and I was at a particular uh, season in my life, if you will, where I was having a hard time. I was struggling with whether or not I was supposed to stay in vocational ministry or maybe hang it up and go do something else. And I was just down and having a hard time. And I was praying. I was in the sanctuary alone. And for about an hour, I kept praying, Lord, do you want me to keep doing what I'm doing in this ministry? Do you want me to stay the course? Or do you want me to, to go do something else now, some other kind of ministry in some other area? And so I just kept praying over and over again, Lord, do you want me to keep doing what I'm doing? Do you want me to stay the course or, or do something else? And uh, service time came, and the service began. I was leading worship, and a man came walking in the back in business attire. <clears throat> and I noticed him because it was not a large church, and so, you know, when someone comes in that you don't recognize. And he's dressed a little bit uh, uh, more dressed up than everyone else. And uh, he sat through the service, and when the service was over, that guy walked up to me, and he said, Excuse me, I just flew in tonight to Greenville uh, from Michigan on business. I've never been to this city before. I'm a believer. And he said, when I got in my rental car, I really felt impressed of the Lord that I wasn't supposed to go straight to my hotel. So I started driving. And he said, I know this sounds crazy, and I'm no prophet, but he said, I felt like the Lord told me to pull in here as I was passing by this church. So I did, and I walked in. And he said, the moment I walked in the room and saw you leading worship, I felt like I was supposed to walk up to you and, and tell you the Lord wants you to keep doing what you're doing. He wants you to stay the course. He said, now I got a meeting early in the morning. I'm leaving. Goodbye. And he turned around and walked out. Are you kidding me? I hadn't talked to anyone else at that point except God about what I was feeling. And even though I knew the ministry that, that God had called me to, in that moment I needed, I needed some confirmation, and God answered supernaturally through a complete stranger. The, the fact of the matter is, we don't have the ability, the strength, the talent, or the wisdom to do everything that Jesus commanded us to do without His Spirit working in our lives and through our lives. We don't. So... Jesus, if you think about it this way, standing on a mountain in Galilee, commands us, his followers, to do something that we cannot do. Something that is positively impossible for us to accomplish. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You may not know this, but we are utterly incapable of fulfilling those instructions by Jesus. And he knew that when he said it. So why tell us to do something that he knows we could never do? Well, he said something else that explains it. He said something just before and just after those instructions that makes all the difference in the world. In fact, what he says before and after this command is the difference between guaranteed success and absolute failure. So we just read verse 19 to halfway through verse 20. Now let's read verses 18 to the end of 20. It says, And Jesus came to, that and said, came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So just before telling them what they must do, he qualifies the command with the fact that he alone has the authority to give them that command. And then he says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, which under any other circumstances would be completely impossible 
for us to do, but he immediately explains then how that will actually be possible. He says, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. I'm with you always to the end of the age. That statement right there is the only reason that we can actually do what he told us we must do. Otherwise, we could never comply with that command. Jesus made it clear back in John chapter 15, verse 5. He said, apart from me, you can do some great things. That's not what he said, actually. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? Without Jesus, we're hopelessly lost, completely ineffective, and thoroughly good for nothing. As far as the Great Commission is concerned, we cannot save anyone, we cannot convict anyone, we cannot convince anyone, we cannot disciple anyone or even lead them toward Christ apart from the Spirit of Christ working in us and working through us. But with Him, <laughs> that's a different story altogether. With Him, the possibilities are endless. With Him, we can do all things, in fact, that He commands us to do. With Him, we, the Church of Jesus Christ, are a force to be reckoned with in this world. With Him, we are unstoppable. When His disciples asked Jesus how men could possibly be saved from their sins, in Matthew 19, 26, He replied, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, we can fill this place with all of the talent and all of the genius and all of the energy and vigor that we can muster. We can have the greatest ideas, the most culturally relevant presentation, and the best of everything that mankind has to offer to bring it all together. And yet at the end of the day, every single shred of it will amount to exactly nothing if we don't have the Spirit of Christ working in us and working through us. Why? Because apart from Him, we can do nothing. But the really good news is, when Jesus said, I'm with you always, to the end of the age, He was referring to His Spirit being in us always, which is the focus of His teaching in our story today as we continue working our way through the Gospel according to John in a message titled, The Holy Spirit in Us. As we read it together this morning, I would like for us, this church, to consider how far we're willing to go to accomplish the task that he set before us because we have the Spirit of Christ living inside of us. I mean, what could we accomplish together if we truly relied on his Spirit in us? How far could we take this gospel how many lives could we affect for the sake of the matchless name of Jesus Christ? How many souls could we snatch from the fire? What kind of disciples could we become if together we truly relied on the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you, the possibilities are breathtaking. Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, but apart from Him, He says we can do nothing. And so the key is not how good of a job we can do. The key is how much we're willing to rely on the Holy Spirit while we're doing the job together. So we just went through chapter 15 where Jesus talked about how we must be true believers who produce much fruit, who are productive doing His work, and how much we must abide in His love. And in the process, He goes on to tell us just how much the world would hate us for that, how difficult it would be the price that we were going to have to pay for it. But notice that in both the chapters before and after chapter 15. So just before and just after telling us what we're supposed to be doing and how much of a struggle that's actually going to be for us at times. The difficulty, the hatred, he says, the persecution. Uh, we will be ostracized for some of us, even death. Just before that in chapter 14 and just after that in chapter 16, Jesus focuses on the Holy Spirit in us. That isn't random or coincidental because he knows that we cannot accomplish any of what he's commanded us to do without that Spirit working in us. So let's turn there together to John chapter 16 and we'll pick up where we left off last week, the second half of, 
verse 4, and we'll read through verse 6. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So Jesus explains that he didn't need to tell them about everything they would face until now because he's been with them. And so the ire of the world, the, the opposition to the gospel message has all been directed at Jesus himself up to now. But that is shifting because his hour has come and so he's about to leave them. Which means that from here on forward, the hatred of the world for Jesus and his message is going to be directed to all those who identify themselves with him which again he talked about in chapter 15 and the first part of 16, which we looked at last week. And so now his disciples are becoming despondent. They're filled with grief, it says, because their master, their rabbi, their, their messiah, their friend, the one who they have devoted their entire lives to is about to leave. Yet it becomes even more intense because he says something to them that when I think about must have been completely befuddling, the very last thing that his friends would have expected to hear. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, of course, as Jesus' followers today, we have somewhat of an understanding of the concept, at least, and the experience of the Holy Spirit with us, because that's all we've ever known. But consider for a moment how that must have sounded to these disciples, whose entire experience with Jesus thus far has been to live with Him, talk with Him, learn from Him, minister with Him, face to face, in the flesh, for years now. This is all they've ever known, Jesus in the flesh. And then he says to them one day, I'm leaving. Where I'm going, you cannot come, but it's okay because it is to your advantage that I leave since there's this other person that I'm going to be sending to you. All right? For the disciples, this was devastating. They didn't understand it and they could not comprehend it. As we'll see next week, they were crushed because Jesus was leaving them and that's all they could hear right now. They didn't want some other version of him. They didn't want an advocate. They didn't want a helper. They didn't want a spirit. They wanted Jesus in the flesh. And they couldn't comprehend any version of following him without him actually being there with them in the flesh. They certainly couldn't see how they could ever be better off any other way. And yet that's exactly what Jesus was telling them. He says, you are better off with my spirit in you than you are with me next to you. But his followers simply couldn't believe that. And to be honest, I'm not so sure that we believe it now. It's easy to get all misty-eyed about what it must have been like to experience Jesus in the flesh, to have walked with him in the first century as his followers did then, to long for those days and how powerful that must have been. And I understand that sentiment. But in the process, we can completely miss the fact that what we have now is infinitely better because with the Holy Spirit inside of us, we have unlimited access to Christ. What I mean by that is when Jesus physically walked the earth, he was with his disciples only when he was physically with them. So if Jesus wasn't standing there with them, he wasn't with them, right? Their proximity to Jesus was limited by the natural, physical presence of Jesus. With His Holy Spirit in us now, we're never without access to Him. We're no longer limited by the natural, physical incarnation of the Christ because we have the supernatural Spirit of Christ living inside of us. So His disciples then could only observe what we can now experience. Because now his power and guidance and wisdom and revelation and strength, all those attributes that those early disciples observed in him, all those things now reside in us because his spirit resides in us. In Ephesians 2.18, Paul says, Through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. That wasn't the case while Jesus walked the earth. So would it have been amazing 
to physically walk with Jesus in the first century? I'm sure, I'm sure that it would have been. But thinking that those early followers somehow had an advantage that we don't have, listen, that's a big mistake. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. It is to our advantage that Jesus goes away. In other words, we're far better off now than they were then. But to be honest, I don't know if we really believe that. We admire the days of his first coming, and we long for the days of his second coming, hoping we can survive all the days in between, as if we need to try and hold on till the power and salvation that is Jesus Christ someday returns to this earth. But he said, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now, of course, uh, Luke 12, 40, Jesus says, uh, be ready for his return. Philippians 3, 20, we're told that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So do we eagerly await his return? Of course we do. But in the meantime, we are not to despise the here and now, and we don't have to because we have the Holy Spirit in us, which is better, according to Jesus, than having him standing beside us. Now, we really should spend some time meditating on that thought really thinking deeply about the reality of that statement by Jesus. Because if we believe in the work that he did while he was on the earth, then we should believe that all of that same work can be happening in and through us today. In fact, he couldn't have been any clearer. In chapter 14, verse 12, he said, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. We can do all that because I'm leaving. And then in chapter 15 and up to this point, he describes all the work that we must do for him to the point that we're laying down our lives for one another. And then he goes on to say the world's going to hate you for it. They're going to persecute us. They're going to ostracize us. They, they might even kill us for it. And by the way, he says, I'm out of here. It's no wonder they were depressed. Who wouldn't be, right? How in the world would they ever be able to do even a fraction of what he's talking about without him being there? But Jesus understands exactly what they're thinking and what they're feeling, and so he begins to explain to them that the one he's going to send, he's described in the original Greek as the parakletos. We talked about him last week. He's the advocate, the helper, the Holy Spirit. He is the means by which the work that Jesus commanded us to do gets done through us because he enables us to actually be able to do what Jesus commanded us to. So Jesus is telling them that because he's leaving, they're going to be able to do far more now than they've ever been able to do so far, even while Jesus was with them. Just listen to what he says, verses 8 through 11. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me, Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. You see, only God can convict people of their sin. Only God can make someone righteous. Only God has the authority to judge the world. And as long as Jesus was on the earth in the form of a man, he was only in one place at one time. But now, by his Spirit in us, he's everywhere that we are. Not that he's limited by us, he's not, but that we now have unlimited access to him. And not only do we have unlimited access to Christ, but because his Holy Spirit is in us, we have the power of Christ working in us. So that through us now, the Holy Spirit carries on the same work that Jesus did and commanded us to do which we see immediately being confirmed at Pentecost as the Holy Spirit comes upon the followers of Christ. And then Peter, by the power of that Spirit in him, stands up and preaches a sermon. You can read it in Acts 2. And in verses 37 through 41, we see the result. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. It said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. 
with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying save yourselves from this crooked generation and so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls the first mega church that never would have happened without the power of the Spirit of God working through Peter wouldn't have happened and so we listen we look at the life of Christ on the earth and we expect him to do amazing things because he was God in the flesh. And then we look at the, the life of the apostles and we expect them to do amazing things because they walked in the power of the Spirit of Christ within them. Then we look at our own lives and we don't expect anything. Why is that? What has changed? I can tell you one thing that definitely has not changed, and that's God. The very same Spirit of God that lived inside his followers in the first century, that enabled the apostles to do what they did, that same Spirit lives inside of us in the 21st century. It hasn't changed at all. So what's different from then to now? John 5 19 Jesus said the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does that the son does likewise so we know that Jesus completely relied on God the father in 2nd Corinthians 1 9 the Apostle Paul describing a particularly difficult time for himself and the others he said indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves but on the God who raises the dead. See, the apostles learned to completely rely on God. Now what's the difference between then and now? Why don't we expect the amazing, the miraculous, the power of Christ to work profoundly in us and through us as he did then? My guess is that we have yet to learn to completely rely on God. And I just want to encourage you, if that statement describes you this morning, then it, know that at least you're not alone because I may well be the president of that club. This is perhaps my greatest struggle. And I would venture an educated guess. I bet it ranks at the very top of the list among the all-time greatest struggles for followers of Jesus Christ around the world. Because it is much easier in our flesh to rely on what we can see, what we can quantify, what we can calculate and plan and execute under our own power than it is to wade into those deep waters of the unknown plan of God for our lives and completely trust in Him to guide us into a future that we cannot see. And so we don't need the amazing, miraculous, powerful work of the Holy Spirit nearly as much when every day has already been planned out and decided by us. And so we never really learn to wholly rely on His Spirit within us. Of course, Jesus knew. He knew how much, He knew just how much you and I were going to struggle with this. He knew we would try to rely on ourselves because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And so He says in verses 12 through 15, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare to you all that the Father has is Mine. Therefore I said that He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. Okay, so Jesus says, look, there's a lot more that you have yet to learn here but you cannot bear it now. And the fact is, there's always more to learn. When it comes to our lives being guided into all the truth, we can only and ever take in limited amounts of knowledge and understanding because our God is limitless. He is without boundaries. He is uncontainable and indefinable. So we can never exhaust the possibility of learning more about Him or of knowing Him more. There's always more for us to learn. And the reason that he says they cannot bear it now is because they have yet to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit within them, which comes in Acts 2 at the Feast of Pentecost. 
And the reason that they must have the Holy Spirit within them, as Jesus explains, is because when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide them into all truth. So what they ultimately need, they cannot have until Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit comes. This is something we really need to grasp if we're to truly understand the relationship between us and the Holy Spirit and the reason that he lives inside of us to begin with, okay? With the Holy Spirit in us, we not only have unlimited access to Christ and the power of Christ in us, but because he is in us, and only because he is in us, we have a pathway to knowing Christ. All right, back in uh, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus describes himself as the truth. In the ancient Greek, it's the word aletheia. So when he says here, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. It's the same Greek word. It's the same truth he's talking about. Okay, when, when he talks about the truth, he's talking about himself. So what he's saying here is, when the spirit of Christ comes, he will guide you into all that is Christ. Because Christ is the truth. He's saying, when my spirit comes, he will guide you into all that is me, all the things you can't bear right now. He'll guide you into all of that when he comes. And he's saying this to the same men who've been living with him side by side for years now. Can you begin to see why it is better for Jesus in the flesh to leave and to send his spirit? If these guys couldn't bear to know more about him and his plans until his spirit comes, what does that say for us? How much more do we need his spirit? Okay, the Holy Spirit in us is the only pathway by which we can know all that is Christ. And, and by the way, that is his primary function in us. To guide us into all the truth. To guide us into all that is Christ. No more and no less. Because there is no other truth but Jesus Christ. He is the source and sum of all truth. But I think sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as someone we can uh, call upon to do things for us as we try and accomplish our own plans. But he's not, uh, he's not a genie in a lamp, you know? He's, he's not some kind of mystical butler who's waiting to serve at our beck and call. Now, he's, he's there to guide us into Christ, and it's our job to follow him as he guides us. Okay, we, we don't command him. We follow him and as we do, we learn all that is Jesus Christ. And so we, we really have to stop thinking about the Holy Spirit as someone who's primarily there to help us decide which job to choose or who we should marry or which house to buy because his primary function is none of those things. His primary purpose is to guide us deeper into Christ. Now, out of that relationship... Because he loves us and he's sovereign over every single aspect of our lives, do we receive revelation and wisdom and direction about jobs and families and big decisions? Yes, of course we do. But those things come out of a closeness to Christ, which is possible when our primary focus is the same as that of his spirit who's living inside of us, which is to guide us into Christ, to be a pathway for us into Christ. And then Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, he says he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come, which is a reference to everything that transpires then as a direct consequence of being guided into the truth by the Holy Spirit. So again, we can't take this statement out of context or misinterpret it to mean that the Spirit will reveal future events to us randomly, or that He exists primarily to reveal the best personal choices for our future comfort and security. No, He's saying we're going to be guided into all that is Christ, and because of that there will be consequences directly related to following that guidance, which harkens back to what He was just teaching us in chapter 15 about true believers being hated by the world. So here he is tying it all together and he's encouraging and reassuring his disciples that as we follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he will declare to us what is to come. He will show us the way forward in Christ and therefore prepare and equip us for the days ahead, which once again, incidentally, is a reference 
to total reliance on the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then after saying, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Jesus adds, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So just as Jesus never acted or even spoke on his own initiative, he only did exactly what was given to him by the Father, which he points out all throughout this gospel. So too the Spirit only speaks and does what he sees and hears. And Jesus said, he, the Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. And just as Jesus uh, did all that he did to bring glory to the Father, which he points out in several places, chapter 7, uh, verse 18, chapter 17, verse 4, so too the Holy Spirit's work is accomplished to bring glory to Jesus, which we see here in verse 14, when Jesus says, he will glorify me. Now likewise, everything that we do should bring glory to Jesus as we with absolute obedience only speak and do what we hear from the Spirit of Christ and what we see in His Word. Which is another way of saying we need to learn to completely rely on the Holy Spirit in us. We don't have the ability and the strength, the talent, or the wisdom to do everything that Jesus commanded us to do without his spirit working in our lives and through us. We simply cannot accomplish anything of eternal value without his spirit in us. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. And we've probably all heard that many times. But where the reality of that statement often falls apart in our own lives, which is also, by the way, one of the reasons why so many people have become disillusioned with the church and its teachings, is when we try to apply that truth to our own uh, personal desires and plans for life. When we try to leverage our access to Christ and the power of Christ and the pathway to Christ that we have by His Spirit in us, when we try to leverage that in order to achieve personal satisfaction and gain, and when we do that, our purpose is now working against the purpose of His Spirit within us. However, when our primary focus is to know and become more and more like Jesus Christ with every breath, it is then that our focus is the same as His Spirit in us. And when our focus is aligned with the focus of the Spirit of Christ within us, then we not only become totally reliant upon Him, but I'm telling you guys, the world had better look out because we become a force to be reckoned with. And yet it's even more amazing than that because when you start putting people together who are all aligned with the Spirit of Christ, unified in focus and purpose, when you start putting people like that together, the church becomes unstoppable. And the possibilities then of what can be accomplished for the sake of this gospel, I'm telling you, it is breathtaking. It is then that we can expect amazing things to happen when we learn to totally rely on the Holy Spirit in us.